All right. And we are live. I am Law Podcast, LordsofGaming.net. I am Lord Cognito here. Who is this fine gentleman we have in the realm of Redfall today? Uh, I'm Harvey Smith, uh, studio director of Arcane Austin, and co creative director along with Ricardo Bear of Redfall. Awesome, awesome. So, Lord's here getting a chance to get some gameplay behind the scenes. And first thing I want to say off the bat the immersion in the world, just being able to explore this world and see from a single player perspective, it was very unique. What was your mindset to kind of separate single player from the multiplayer portion of the game? Yeah, so we love solo play. We love that immersion. We love that like exploring the world at your own pace and all that. Uh, so this is an open world game that definitely works that way, where it's like all the other arcade games. Uh, you're now one of the first people in the world to play it, so you can testify to that. Uh, and we know that our values the way we make games, it plays very well with the open world. You can just like come at it from any angle and all that. Uh, creative mechanics that you can combine, environmental storytelling everywhere. Uh, the truth is, the co-op is different. Like yes. you can't go, I mean, you, you can play alone or you can play with up to four people. And I'm here to tell you if you're playing alone, it very much feels like an arcane game, as you can, as you can say now, because uh, you play but if you add four people, it's something different. It plays different. It's it's like four people is more like a party roving through the world. You can't play at that slow pace anymore. Unless you have really four people really working on that, somebody's going to do something wild and crazy, right? <laughs> Someone's going to break off screen, yeah, go right. off path, do totally. their thing. Yeah. There's trade-offs. So it's a different game at that point. Uh, but you play through the same missions and stuff. So it's not like there's a co-op track or whatever. You, you either play Redfall solo or... Uh, if you play with one other person and the two of you working together, that can still preserve the sort of player slow pace and like the stealth and, and inferring environmental storytelling and stuff like that. As soon as you add that, you know, third person to fourth person, it speeds up, it becomes something different. Exactly. And it's so key that I feel that you guys have made that distinction. Because as a person, you know, I know Solve, he's well, our, our single player, selfish experience kind of person. So sometimes just being able to explore the world, and again, the worlds that you guys create with so much immersion and just getting lost in it with the details of what is important to a single player person. So I thought that was very cool that the studio made that decision to say, hey, single player, this is distinct in a sense, or from opposed to the, the cooperative experience. Yeah, it really is an open world. It's like wide open, and so you can just wander and get lost in it. I find myself sometimes like getting up on the roof and watching the sunset. The fog rolls in. I zoom in and I, I listen to some overheard conversations. I explore an old house, you know, and I read the notes in there and look at the graffiti on the wall and blood stain on the floor leading up to the, the, the attic or whatever. You know, it's it's not a dismal horror game, but it's spooky action, right? And so there's like Halloween-like horror elements, at least at that level. It's thrilling more than horrifying, I guess. Well, I, I would say there was some horrifying uh, moments for me. <laughs> I would say because once I was in that, immersed in the world and just exploring, I was just almost going room to room, clearing, seeing what the vampires have done in the world, and then encountering your vampires for the first time. You know, it gave a feeling that they are much quicker, much faster than you, and you should you should be still prepared and worried about them as well as the cultists and everything around them. Yeah. So um, I know you mentioned before, kind of like what I noticed in the world, like this blue mist, red mist kind of yeah. thing, and the red mist I would get kind of hurt being in that. Yeah. Could you explain that a little bit, maybe? Yeah, there's like an environmental damage system in the game where like fire and electricity and UV light are all relevant to uh, turning the tide of battle, right? Like blowing up a car, uh, setting off an electrical box, things like that. There are other hazards too. Leading a vampire into uh, a bunch of UV light or whatever and then petrifying them and shattering them, that's all good. Uh, but the, the vampires and the cultists will drop this red mist, we call it death mist, and you take damage in it and it slows you down. And sometimes it chokes out like an entire street for 100 yards. So you have to find, sort of vampires take, the vampires take humans and convert them into different types of familiars. There's a watcher that has a beam for the eyes, there's a thing called Sin Eater, there's a thing called Blood Bag. Well, the Blood Bag, if it gets petrified, it exudes death mist, and so the whole area will be flooded with red. Yes. You take your UV beam and you shine it on the, the Blood Bag and then shatter it, you can clear the Kind of clear that area. The big blue shimmer you were talking about yes. is, that's a big bubble, it gets bigger and bigger, and everything within it get, is harder to fight. Right. So they're buffed. So if you find at the center of that, there's a ghostly door, and if you go into it, 
you're in psychic space, you're in a nest. If you go to the center of that and find the heart of the nest, you can destroy it and clear that blue bubble. Mm. Um, but it's funny to watch people play. Just earlier I was watching somebody play. This is a total out of the frying pan into the fire moment because they were in a fight, health was going down, vampire was coming at them, they blew up a car in the distance, killed some cultists, backed up, backed up, backed up and they backed up into the big blue bubble, turned around, and there's a bunch of harder to fight people coming at them from the other side. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, you want to clear the nest when you can to get rid of that. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I've noticed is the visceral nature of the combat, which I didn't expect in the sense of, you know, not only do you, when you shoot the vampires, they're in a down state. Yeah. But they're not finished. Right. And you have to so, go finish them. Talk about yeah. that mechanic and just the, the combat aspect. Yeah, that was a, a thing we really wanted. Ricardo pushed hard for that as well. That, like, you can't just kill the vampires with guns. Uh, you can shoot, you can kill monsters with guns in lots of games. But in our game, if you get them down, you do enough damage, they go down, they're in a vulnerable state, they will regenerate and come back from that. Similarly, if you UV them and they petrify and you leave them alone for a while, they will like revivify, reanimate. So you have to break off what you're doing while they're down and go stake them. Yes. Yeah. Or use fire, electricity, burn them up, one of your powers. Um, Jacob can up, upgrade his raven so that it can stake vampires as he's flying around. Layla can up, uh, upgrade her umbrella so that she unleashes it. it dust them as well. A fire is your friend in this game. Yes, so. abso absolutely. The only thing I notice is the uniqueness as far as the weapons and then almost as a person who plays that game, plays like movie shooters, I notice almost category grades of weapons, things of that nature, shotguns, close up weapons, semi automatic weapons, and even some very high powerful weapons like beams and things like that. What goes into the thought process of, of that variety of weapons and also like the distinction from class, like you know, different yeah. colors represent maybe uh, different uh, abilities or strengths? Yeah, we are comfortable putting the like weapons you see in other games. We use a fictional brand names because we have no desire to give the weapons manufacturer money uh, but so we make up our own fictional brands uh, but we have shotguns assault rifles pistols machine pistols all that kind of fun stuff and then we have a whole class of vampire hunter weapons and that the thought process there is what's your game about that's distinct our game is about New England it's about psychic vampires created by this scientific process where a company called Avum was looking to use the blood of the young to extend the life of their wealthy clients. They accidentally created vampires, psychic-based vampires, or science-based vampires, not supernatural. But if you're going to lean into that, you want vampire hunting guns. So yes. it's it being an island, a kind of a tourist island with a lot of boating, uh, there's a lot of flare guns lying around. Flare yes. gu gun becomes like a mini fireball. You can find a double barrel flare gun, you know, and you can burn the vampires up with that. We also have a thing called a stake launcher. Okay. It uses found ammo, like a snapped off pool cue or a mop handle or something, and you can stake the vampires at a distance. Okay. And the one you alluded to is the UV beam. Yes. It's your personal portable way to, to do UV light and petrify the vampires and then shatter them. And then across all the guns, whether it's a shotgun or pistol or the UV beam or whatever, you can find grades of weapons. They yes. You level up through the game and you can find higher and higher level weapons uh, eventually, even your good guns, you'll be so high level compared to them that you probably want to scrap them and, and get something higher level. Uh, so you're constantly churning through guns in this game, and eventually, ideally, you end up with a very uh, a, a set of very high quality uh, guns. Yeah, the gun, the guns felt good. The combat felt great. You know, definitely like what I saw in there. And then as far as just um the narrative progressing, you know, one thing we kind of talked about was kind of like. You know what you do in the world. You know it's affected the other vampire gods and other things. See that. So as I'm assuming, as you clear things out, you know whether it be the relationships with the cultists or other vampires, things can immerse and happen actively in the world. Is that the case? Yeah, we have a strong uh, narrative in all of our games, both at the micro level, where you're looking at a room and you're like, what happened here? There's a uh, dead person in the corner and a note over here and a red candle on the windowsill. What does this all mean? Let me read this note. We have that sort of micro level, but we also have the macro level where there's a whole series of story missions. Uh, you don't have to do all of them. Some of them are optional. Some of them can be done in different orders, uh, but there's a story-based campaign. And then we have sort of like a mid-level of narrative where like, and the game progresses as you do all of that, but like we have this mid-level where it's a neighborhood capture system where you go from neighborhood to neighborhood. Each neighborhood has a safe house. We can do some, some gameplay there to get the generator on, the yes. UV lights come on. Started one of those safe houses, I did, yeah. <laughs> and then you go into the safe house, you can take 
some missions there, you can resupply. And once you've done the mission in the safe house, then you have an underboss mission. And so every neighborhood has an underboss. It's a named vampire with a handcrafted setup to fight it. Ooh. And the fog rolls in, and it's an elite vampire. We have elites okay. with uh, elites and specials with traits that make them more powerful as, as you play. Um, and so you, if you kill the underboss, you've secured that neighborhood. That neighborhood is safer passing back and forth. And after that, you can also use the safe house to fast travel. Gotcha. Oh, so that'll be a fast travel system once you clear that out. There's historical markers that you can find in the world, and if you find them, flares go up from them, and you, they're on your map now, and you can fast travel to there, and the safe house is also awesome. That's awesome. I love that aspect. I want to ask, like, now, obviously, the team, you get close to the finish line. You know, a lot of hard work. You've been on previous projects before. What, yeah. what are some of the traits about Redfall that you want, like, the audience to know that, hey, maybe, they didn't know coming in, and right. now that you're getting close to release, you want to kind of let that out. It's a full open world, but it's built on the back of all the arcane values. Um, you can hack turrets and pick locks and get on the roof and watch the sunrise. Uh, you can fully explore. The players aren't tethered. You can wander the world. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> because I could get out to cut you. Um, mm -hmm. One of my concerns was coming in, because I know there was talk about you know, online, online, things like that. But one thing that I think is a positive, what you just said, is being untethered in a cooperative experience. Hey, Saul is in one area, he's going exploring, I'm going. Right. There's not this radius that keeps us right. like locked in as yeah. other games. Like, what was your thought process to kind of open that up from a technical standpoint? Uh, yeah, well, our, we said we'd love this, and our core tech people were like, you're crazy, we can't do that, and we said, please, and they said, let's think about it. Okay. And so, uh, you know, we thought for a while we might have to tether uh, the four players together, uh, but the way our system works, it breaks the whole world up into a bunch of 126 by 126 meters sectors, and uh, it handles persistence when the player uh, does something in an area. We mostly remember those things. Um, it allows, uh, it, does a very, it does a very good job of, uh, we don't let lights overlap. We do a lot of, a lot of things to like keep the game running and perform it. And um, we just didn't find it necessary to tether people. So we do collect you up as a group before you go into certain mission areas okay. and such. But generally, if you want to wander one end of the street, I want to go in the opposite direction. Now the problem with that is, Let's go. The game is set for the difficulty of two of us. Let's say the three of us play. The game is now scaled Scaling. up with the number of, not bullet sponges or not more enemies, but rather the number of elites that you encounter. Okay. You find more specials and more elites, so they're harder. Gotcha. And so if I'm off on my own, I'll be fighting uh, vampires and cultists and bellwether soldiers that are... Uh, set for the level of three people fighting them and I'm on my own. So ah. it's kind of a soft encouragement to yeah, like come back together get, and work get as a team. Over here. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't yeah. go off too far. Right. <laughs> no, fair enough, fair enough. I, I love that aspect. Game looks phenomenal. You know, it plays great. Um, I love the atmosphere. Everything feels good about it. And uh, yeah, we're getting excited. We're getting excited. We're getting close to launch at NPC Game Pass, the whole bit. Just um, what's the relationship with Microsoft as you get closer to finish and throughout the process? Yeah, this team has been through so much along the way. We started this project before COVID. Uh, we've had, you know, a pandemic. Everybody went work from home. We had the Great Resignation uh, in Austin. We had multiple ice storms that shut the electrical grid down for weeks at a time. We had to boil our water for a while. The country had an insurrection. We had important social movements happening across the country. Right? This t we had murder hornets. The Air Force was talking about aliens at one point. We had so many things happen in the last few years that I think would have tanked a lot of development teams uh, and Arcane we didn't work people too hard we gave everybody Fridays off during the worst part of the pandemic we the company was kind enough to extend the date so that we could just not have to crunch ourselves to death um, and we just kept putting the love into it uh, now one of the things that happened along the way the reason I was rattling all that stuff off is company got bought by Microsoft yes. and uh, that's a big sea change as well for us but you know what uh, so far it's been awesome uh, you know we're on Game Pass PC and Xbox in some sense that um, allows us to focus on fewer platforms so we can dedicate ourselves but also the number of people that are going to be looking at this game because of Game Pass is bigger I think than anything Arcane has seen before uh, I don't remember the number of subscribers that are on Game Pass it's going up all the time. But that's a lot of people who are going to be like, oh, I have Game Pass. Look, the new Arcane game's out. Let me play that. And so 
uh, it's really an exciting idea. Um, and then it's also because the game is, um, there's no MTX in the game, no store, but it's right. online. And so we can keep updating it. If we see in a given period that everybody's dying from falling, we can adjust falling damage or ladder code or whatever uh, to try to you know reduce those deaths. Um, so it's a it's a really exciting uh, model to be working in. No, it's awesome, awesome. It's good to see, like I said, you you guys persevere through all those obstacles. Obviously, and yeah, you get acquired and then you get closer to the finish line to see it all come together. Because game development is hard; it's not yeah. easy. And uh, it's really cool to see that you mentioned that. Last thing I wanted to ask in reference to the characters: a lot of flavor, a lot of personality. I touched Layla. I was doing the little absorb the the, the bullets coming at me, shoot them back, and then right. Super with her boyfriend comes out. He's vampire fighting with me kind of yeah. thing. You know, you got three other characters currently right now. Um, just briefly, the distinctions and maybe your favorite characters, you know, between all four that are currently there. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned a few things in there. I do think this is our best feeling shooter. Uh, like, we always do direct combat or stealth, environmental storytelling, a little RPG features, a little bit of shooter features. Uh, and our guns feel okay normally. I think this is the first time where I think our guns feel great. I love our guns. And it, it does feel very visceral as Sake of Empire and all that. Um, but in terms of the characters, we have four at launch. Uh, Defender Crossley is a guy from the UK. He's kind of a cryptid hunter and a streamer. He's always, yeah, that's been, YouTube. That's YouTube. He's always been a true believer in Yeti and Sasquatch, or not, he doesn't believe in Sasquatch actually. I, I think that's the one he calls ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, but he believes in ghosts and vampires and things, so uh, this is an exciting moment for him. Uh, Layla was a medical student on the island who volunteered for some uh, uh, blood trials with Avum and ended up with telekinetic powers. Uh, Remy De La Rosa is uh, a combat engineer with a little miniature bot called Ribon. She go she's a search and rescue. Uh, operator, she goes into flood zones and fire zones and war zones and pulls people out of the wreckage. Rebon is a lot of fun to play with. He'll fight your enemies and all that. She buffs the team with her rally power. she got a C4 block as well. Um, and last but not least is Jacob, who was, he's a sniper from Bellwether, yeah. And they're, they're kind of the bad guys, but Jacob got separated from them and joined the team. And so he's probably the most questionable up front. But one other thing I'll say about the characters, and we haven't talked too much about this, is if you play alone, you play alone, right? You're, you don't have the other squad with, with you. You're totally solo. Yeah. And let's say you're playing with the vendor and you're moving through the world, he will comment on things. If you're playing Layla and you go past a yogurt shop, she'll say like, oh my god, I got yogurt here so many times in my freshman year. Uh, if you're playing with another character, they will have a corresponding line. So if you're playing with Jacob and Layla, she might say that, and he might say, when I, was, when I was growing up, we didn't have yogurt, we just had ice cream. Ooh, you know, so they'll go back that. and forth. Yeah. And at first, they're almost like strangers. The longer they play together, there's this thing called the trust system, okay. where their lines get more and more intimate, more like, you've saved my life, I've saved your life. They become friends. And there's a mechanical buff called the trust buff that builds up over time when you play with them as well. So if you play consistently, repeatedly, with a set of characters, they build up trust between them and their lines get more intimate. So that's like a little narrative feature that we like. It's pretty cool. Uh, so I don't have a favorite character. I've played all of them. Um, and they're all fun in different ways, right? They all respond in different ways. Um, yeah, it just depends. You have to, you have to pick. <laughs> you ain't picking about amongst his yeah. kids. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Look, we have got a chance to play. We've got a chance to play Redfall again. May 2nd. May 2nd it comes out. May 2nd. We're getting close to finish line. The game feels absolutely awesome. Love the environment. Love the skill trees as well. Just being a deep dive and configure the way I wanted to configure and power certain abilities, things of that nature. Gunplay feels great. We're getting excited. Therefore, any final things you want to say to the round before we close out here? Uh, God, we've been through so much to make this game. We're so proud of it. We hope you love it as much as we do. Uh, and along the way, we've tried to communicate what it is, and they always say, like, talking about music is like dancing about architecture, right? It's very hard to convey what a game is until you put your hands on it, right? And so that's why it's so gratifying that people have not played it, uh, because they will all walk away from this press tour, first people in the world that really played the game besides the team, they walk away saying, wow, this really is open world, this really does feel like an atmospheric, single player, arcane experience. Uh, 
Man, that's very gratifying. It's very gratifying to finally get that response. Right. An absolute pleasure. Yeah. Uh, in the realm of the Lords, IMP got a chance to play this amazing game of Red 4. Coming soon, May 2nd, Xbox, PC, Game Pass. We cannot play. Again, an absolute pleasure. Arcane Austin in the building. Iron Lord Podcast. Salute.